Welcome Eastview Church family and all our online guests who are joining us. While we would all love to be here physically worshiping together, we know that different times call for different approaches. We are very thankful that God has blessed this church with great media and video equipment, some of which was just upgraded literally a few weeks ago. Also, we're so thankful that our media team is helping us and working very hard behind the scenes to facilitate ministry to us all during this time. Online giving, of course, is available and very important during this time. Go to our website, eastviewupc.com, click on giving, and it will walk you through steps that are very self-explanatory. Your giving is very important. You can designate what account you're giving to, and your contribution will be on your charitable contribution statement at the end of the year. If you're not on our one call list receiving our voicemails, let us know. We want you to be uh, receiving messages from us regarding uh, the changing schedules and all the things we're having to do to adapt during this time. If you have a need, please do not try to bear your burden alone. It's very important that you reach out to a brother or sister, even if it's just to talk or pray together over the phone or texting your needs one to another. The Bible says to do that, to pray for one another that you may be healed. Your effectual fervent prayer still avails much, even in times like this. Reach out to a ministry leader or us pastors, and we'll be glad to help you during this time. On Sunday evenings, we're going to be playing some classics, Eastview classics, services that God has blessed us with in the past, which is important if you're a new member to Eastview, you can kind of see what God has done in the past that's brought us to this point. Or if you've been around Eastview for many years, you will appreciate what God has done back then, and maybe you were even in some of these services. Tonight, we're going to take you back to September of 2012. And it was in that service that Brother O.W. Williams, a great man of God who pastored this church for many years, he was joined by Brother James Kilgore. And we're going to take you to that service right now. So gather your family together and ask God to speak to your heart through this great word. God bless you in Jesus' name. United Pentecostal Church International in many leadership positions. Well, it was in the middle of the night on a pallet laid on the dirt floor of an auto mechanic's garage in Idaho that a 12-year-old boy began to weep, receiving his initial call to the ministry. Well, James' early life was spent traveling across the country with his ministering family, singing in the old brush arbors, tent meetings, building pulpits and altar benches and churches, and eventually preaching the gospel. Well, he went on to attend Apostolic Bible School in Tulsa, Oklahoma from 1944 to 1946. In July of 1950, young evangelist James Kilgore met the love of his life in Sherman, Texas, and six weeks later married Imogene Ellen Ritchie, September the 13th, 1950. Well, the new couple would begin their marriage in the parsonage of their first church in Paris, Texas, where the Kilgores began pastoring in August of 1950. Well, eight years later in November of 1957, brother and sister Kilgore felt the call to the metro city of Houston, leaving behind a growing congregation. Well, it was in the city of Houston that the Kilgore family reached thousands of souls, mentoring hundreds of Sunday school workers, Bible school students, evangelists, pastors, and missionaries. The well, Life Tabernacle grew breaking national attendance records, starting many daughter works in the city and support numerous missionaries serving on foreign soil, along with helping to establish foreign Bible colleges. Well, it was while serving as pastor of the church in Paris, Texas, that Brother James Kilgore became youth president of the Texas District United Pentecostal Church, serving faithfully from 1952 to 1960. Well, also as a founding father of Texas Bible College, he led as president from 1963 to 1964. With well, the United Pentecostal Church General Conference in Houston, Texas in 1971, elected Brother Kilgore as the Assistant General Superintendent of the Western Zone, an office he filled until becoming the sixth superintendent of the Texas District April the 4th, 1995. Well, under his anointed leadership, the district continued to strive in unity and growth. 
And it was also during his leadership that proposals were made to move Texas Bible College to the district campgrounds, and new dorms were built in Lufkin. Well, so much could be said about this great leader and servant of men. Living his life to serve others has been his most fervent calling. His faithfulness, generosity, compassion, and steadfastness have been strength to people in every walk of life and virtually every country of the world. James Leroy Kilgore will long be a hero to many while remaining an inspiration to the ministry, a comforter to the broken, an encourager and giver to missions, a champion of young people, a leader and friend. Many will forever be touched by the legacy of this great man who served the Texas district from 1995 until 2002. Well, may the Texas District of the United Pentecostal Church continue to carry the vision for the whole gospel to the whole world by the whole church. To this great man stepped Otis Wesley Williams. He was born May the 3rd, 1919, the 13th of 14 children in a poor farming family that resided about 70 miles west of Nashville, Tennessee, in the community of Pleasantville. Well, Brother Williams recalls the memories of his childhood without any electricity, refrigeration, even periods of going without food, and then the memories of enjoying a good meal of squirrel and rabbit and other farm animals. Well, as far as any religious upbringing, there really wasn't one in the Williams family. But the Williams recalls his younger years of playing the guitar and going to the honky-tonk hangouts. However, he cultivated a desire for God and would go into the cornfields to pray while in his teen years. One memory that strongly stands out is when young Otis Williams wept in the altar, tears of deep repentance. Well, this occurred under the evangelistic ministry of Johnny Stubblefield, who preached that night in a converted schoolhouse under the auspices of the Pentecostal Church Incorporated. However, it would be a while later, in the early 1930s, before Brother Williams received his own personal Pentecost, receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost in an Assembly of God church service. Well, in the service, Brother Williams remembers how the power of God knocked him on the floor, where he stayed for nearly four hours praising God and speaking in tongues. Well, as time went on, Brother Williams placed himself under the anointed leadership and mentorship of a great oneness Pentecostal minister, Pastor E.E. E. McNatt in Memphis, Tennessee. It was here in Memphis that Brother McNatt began to train and teach Brother Williams on how to truly live and serve God. A short while later, Brother Williams was called upon to minister in an outdoor meeting where this would become his first sermon. Brother Williams would go on to serve in several positions of leadership within the Pentecostal Church Incorporated, including presbyter under Howard Goss and working in the youth department. Well, this was a launching pad for Brother Williams' future leadership and ministry within the Texas District United Pentecostal Church. And from here, he began evangelistic work, home missions planning, pastoring, and eventually serving as presbyter. Well, finally, after years of pastoral ministry, the Brethren of the United Pentecostal Church elected Brother Williams to be their next superintendent of the Texas District. He was elected in a special call district conference in Houston, Texas, September the 19th, 1972, to fulfill the term of Ye Gidrose due to his ill health and retirement. Well, Brother Williams would serve the district for three terms of office, where under the anointed leadership of this great man, the current district campground tabernacle would be built. Well, interestingly enough, two special conferences had to be called for the brethren to actually catch the vision for this construction. Because number one, the issue was that, well, it was too big. And number two, the issue was, how could they pay for this? Well, however, agreement was made to proceed with the building. And during Brother Williams' last year of service, proposals were presented for moving district headquarters to Lufkin, Texas. Well, great revival occurred during the tenure of O.W. Williams. One memorable time is recall of a special meeting where Brother Williams called all the Texas ministers to Pastor Paul Hush's church in Dallas, asking them to bring their sleeping bags, challenging them to plan on staying two or three days. 
Well, it was a great time of prayer and fasting, and strongholds were broken, and great revival was the result. As the scriptures remind us, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Well, thank God for the sacrifice and service of another great man of God who helped build up the kingdom of God in the Texas district. What an awesome privilege tonight to have these two great men of God worshiping the Lord with us in this service. I am so grateful for their ministries. These short presentations only cover a very, very small part of what God has used these great men to do. They've touched probably tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of lives. And I believe that as God has directed this service tonight to have Brother O.W. Williams and Brother Kilgore with us, I, I'm thankful that it's turned out like it has. I believe it's in God's time. I believe God has a special purpose for it. And I just want the Holy Ghost to have its way tonight. We're honoring these men because they are well deserving of honor. The scripture says, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. It's because of the faithfulness of Brother Kilgore and Brother Williams that you and I have the wonderful opportunity to worship God in a sanctuary like this, with a congregation like this, with an opportunity like we have. Now, their spirit is a spirit that will allow us to emulate them. I'm, I would not, there's some folks that I wouldn't want us to, to even be around because it's always about me, it's always about mine, and it's always about us. But Brother Kilgore and Brother Williams, it's always about the kingdom of God. And as a young minister, these two men have had such an impact on my life Texas Bible College, Brother Williams was one of my instructors. Brother Kilgore was the president of Texas Bible College at one time while I was there. And I've always had the utmost respect for these great men of God. Now tonight, originally, we were going to sit in these chairs and have a real comfortable time of conversation. But about two minutes before church service started, the preacher came out in both of them. And so I felt, you know what? We really need to go ahead. We'll just bring that pulpit out. And we'll let them minister to us. Brother Williams is going to minister first. He's going to talk to us. Oh, excuse me, Brother Kilgore is going to minister to us first. He's going to talk to us about the great miracles that even involved his dad's ministry and the great things that he's been able to see God do through his ministry. Brother Kilgore, we welcome you to this pulpit, to this church, and we thank you, sir, for your service to the kingdom of God. Thank you. You'll stand. Thank you. Hallelujah. To God be the glory, to God be the glory, to God be the glory for the things He has done with His blood. He has saved me by His power. He has raised me, so to God be the glory for the things He has done. Woo. Praise God. 
Amen, amen, amen. You can be seated. I deeply appreciate Brother Hunt. I've enjoyed working with him many, many years. What a blessing he has been to the work of God and to the Texas district. Then finally, to Lufkin Eastview Church. And uh, I think, you know, the way this is moving, this ought to be his last move right here at this church. What we want. And to hear the programs that are going and see how everybody is working together, it really rejoices my heart and I thank the Lord for all that he's doing for the kingdom of God and planning this day. I think Brother Williams and I both have looked forward to it. I, I hope and pray that I could... Uh, I could express all the things that I feel in my heart. A lot of mixed emotions when I get to thinking about the past and then uh, the present and then the possibilities of the future. But thank you for coming. Now I will have to go home and pray all night so that I could be what they think I am. That presentation was my. My wife turned over in her grave when she <laughs> heard that. But uh, thank you, Brother Hunt. This is a wonderful, wonderful privilege and a great night. And uh, I trust and pray that it will bless all of you. And I think you'd like to have a lot of information uh, for Heritage Day here, and I will do my best, and I'm glad to hook up with my dear, good friend, Brother O.W. Williams. What a blessing he has been to me. We pastored in the same area. He pastored in Kilgore, Texas, and I was in Paris, Texas, and our paths uh, crossed every few weeks, and we had wonderful fellowship together. And uh, he's been a successful leader in so many different ways, as an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher, an official. He's one of those that has been willing to go just a little further in operation and ministerial gifts. Ephesians 4, God gave the church a five-fold ministry, prophets, prophets, pastors, apostles, evangelists, <clears throat> teachers. Amen. And he has fulfilled all of those quite well. He's operated in the nine spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and especially the gift of faith and the gift of healing. And uh, I'll never forget those great meetings that he held and the healing services. And uh, he sort of revived what had been a kind of pushed back in Pentecost for a number of years. They didn't uh, let her rain, giving people gifts and all of that, going beyond the Word of God. Uh, people oh. kind of backed off. But... Brother Williams had a call, a genuine call to pray for the sick and to exercise faith that God had given him. And I've got to tell you this, my dear sweet wife, bless her heart, she's been gone 12 years. I've suffered a little bit every day. And uh, at one, at one time she had kidney stones for three days, suffered death. I'm telling you, rolling on the bed, getting on the floor and rolling in such terrible pain. And finally, the third day, I said, you, won't, you wouldn't let me take you to the doctor, so I'm going to do the next best thing. I'm going to take you against your will. She said, no, take me to Brother Williams. 
So we went to his church and he happened to be there. And uh, I never saw anyone suffer like she did. She couldn't stay on the bed. She couldn't stay off of the bed. She walked the floor. She wept. But <clears throat> Brother Williams knelt there, front seat of Stonewall Church. I'll never forget that morning. And he prayed the prayer of faith. God heal my wife instantly. Amen. Instantly. And I really deeply appreciate that special day in our lives. And of course, he's ministered to countless people. And I, I've got to say this because he has gone a little further to bring things to the present that we have needed in Pentecost. And I was raised up in that kind of atmosphere and I know that I have told a lot of these things through the years traveling over the district, but I was privileged to be born into a home that was full of the Spirit. Felt like I was in church every day. Our home was an extension of church. And uh, every day it was like being in church. We just had prayer, we had Bible reading, we had testimonies. We had wonderful things that happened right there in our home. And uh, my father was a Mormon, and, uh, the, and I don't plan to vote for any Mormon. I'm sorry, folks. <laughs> they are built on deception, and I, I don't want that deception to come into our government. But if he's elected, he'll be my president. I'll act like I voted for him. But my dad said he would never change. He told everybody, I will die a Mormon. But a little lady came into the community, Sister Roxy Hughes, Assembly of God evangelist, and had an open air meeting. And uh, dad told everybody, I'll never set foot on that ground. When he came in from work one day, his clothes were all laid out, and he asked my mother, what is this? He said, oh, we're going to that meeting tonight and hear that woman evangelist. Well, he loved her so much, he didn't want to disappoint her. Uh, and so he went into the meeting, he sat down and said, some of you have said you would never be here. You have said you would never change but I'm going to tell you tonight, you're in for a treat and a surprise. God's going to change you. And uh, before she got through preaching, he was weeping and could hardly wait to get to the altar and, and fell out under the power of God and, and uh, came up from there speaking with tongues and stood there for three hours preaching. Oh, God. Isn't that wonderful? That's the kind of uh, preacher I was raised up under. Right. Sincere, right. God-fearing, loved the Lord, never ever heard him talk about anyone, never ever heard him criticize anyone, never preached a camp meeting, never preached a general, uh, any kind of a conference, never uh, served on a board, but he was always the same. He didn't complain. He didn't say it wasn't fair. He didn't say, I wish I had an opportunity. He was always the same. He wanted to find someone that was lost and dying without God. And uh, God helped him become a great, great soul winner. Yes. And uh, yes. he had been in the Assembly of God for two years and he was preaching a little and he baptized two men and the titles and it always worried him when God uh, revealed this glorious truth to, to him about those two men. But then uh, while he was preaching on the bank of a river one day with people that was going to get baptized, he looked up and here are these two men. So when they... When he got ready for the baptism, they came right down in the water. So he said, thank God, I, 
I haven't been guilty of having to go to judgment with people that have been baptized in the Trinity. So these, and miracles, that was the order of the day. It just, they believed it. They wouldn't accept it any other way. And uh, bones broken healed immediately. When I was eight years old, he was preaching in a meeting in Cunningham, Texas. Ice was all over the ground. We were staying with a little lady named Sister Chance. And coming in after service one night, she slipped on that ice and broke her wrist. And it was laid back. I remember it so vividly. It was laid, her hand was laid back on her arm and my dad just pulled it out, put it in place and prayed for it and oh, yeah. uh, demanded, commanded that it would be healed. And she got up the next morning and combed her hair. That was a glorious miracle that took place. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And why shouldn't it be? We, we haven't seen enough miracles. In the great commission that Jesus gave his apostles, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name you'll cast out devils, speak with new tongues, lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. And the secret of that experience, oh, yeah. they went everywhere preaching the word with signs following and the Lord working with them. Right, right. That's our secret. Right. If we, if we try to do it by, by ourselves, the Lord says, just have at it. Let's see what you can do. But if we'll give honor and glory and praise that he deserves and realize he's the great physician, he's the healer of all sickness, of all disease, praise God, and put him first, we're going to see more of it. We've got to have it. Oh, man. <clears throat> In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. And so... I was raised in that atmosphere and, and I was privileged to be a part of a lot of, of his healings and miracles and the thousands that received the Holy Ghost. I, I, uh, was, a lot of it happened before I was born, but uh, I was privileged to be in a part of it. Oh I was privileged to go back and preach the 50th anniversary for 17 of the churches that he built. And the first one was in Friendship, Arkansas. And uh, they had a sign at the front of the entrance of the city, no holy rollers allowed to spend the night in this place. And that's the place that God called him to go preach his first meeting. <laughs> and uh, he went in there and somehow they tried to run him out. They threatened him. When I went back to preach that 50th anniversary in Friendship, Arkansas, they had four old timers that were still living after that revival to come to the platform. I'll never forget that tall gentleman stood there and he said, I never ever expected to be a Pentecostal, a holy roller. And I talked against it. I fought against it. I fought against Elder Kilgore. But I couldn't get away from the fact that every evening he brought his wife and four children at that time up to the stores of our little town and knelt on the ground in front of the stores praying that God would save our community. He said, I don't remember much about his preaching, but I, that was such a vivid picture in my mind. And he said, I thought if a man loved us that much, that he's willing to go that far, there's got to be something to it. And he said, here I stand 50 years later, 
And that experience is still real, grand, and wonderful in my life. Oh, yeah. Praise God. Oh, I thank the Lord for that. And so they told me some good experiences that happened in, in that 50th. But one, the one that's uh, most vivid in my mind was in Lamar County. They uh, were, wanted me to come and preach at 50th anniversary, and, and uh, they had advertised it, and people that had known my father and his ministry uh, came out, and this first revival was right next to a cemetery, Old Woodard Cemetery, and they had put uh, uh, homemade benches out there, and that's where he <coughs> preached his first meeting. And, and uh, I, they had a pickup with a, a stand on it. I stood on the back of the pickup, and I was able to preach. And one dignified man uh, gave a testimony, Marlon Crump. He said, uh, I just had to come. I drove 550 miles to get here, professor in Corpus Christi. Yeah. He said, I just had to get here because I was born with a disease. I couldn't, until I was three years old, I couldn't stand up. I couldn't feed myself. My mother had to give me constant care and attention and said, that night, Elder Kilgore was preaching, and he got down and was just walking back and forth in front of the front row, and my mother brought a big pillow, and I was laying on it beside her. And uh, he just came by and laid his hand on me, my mother said, and said I started wiggling and twisting, and she grabbed me, thought I was going to fall off, and Elder Kilgore just turned around and said, Sister Crump, let him alone. God just healed him. And he slipped to that ground, never having stood alone, never had walked, and started running back and forth across the front. Glory. Glory. Yeah. What an experience. As you can imagine, that was the first miracle that took place in Lamar County and uh, in the different times that dad went in and out of there, he baptized nearly 2,000 people in Jesus' name and a uh, great church. And uh, so when, when, we got, when I got through preaching, uh, Otis Watson, who was the oldest one still left in that church in Cunningham, said, now we're going to walk out to the... Uh, to the great stock pond out here, where the greatest miracle that ever took place in Lamar County, uh, that's where it was, and said, Elder Kilgore had been preaching and only had a few to get baptized in Jesus' name, and he stood out there in the hot sun and preached an hour about the wonderful truth of the gospel, and uh, when he got through and he said, now it's time to line up and get baptized. And, and so uh, Otis said that the, the pond was always full of water moxkins, either on the edge or out uh, in the lake, and, and uh, said when Elder Kilgore stepped his foot in the water, every water moxkin in it st uh, raised its head up. And he said, I'll never forget it. Everybody just gasped when they saw all those snakes. And said, Elder Kilgore said, don't worry, folks. Those snakes are going to get out of here. All you folks at the other end of the pond, make room. I'm going to rebuke these serpents. Instead of picking up serpents, he, serpents, he just commanded them to leave. And said, every one of those serpents slipped over the end of that pool, and they disappeared. And he said, the great miracle of it also is 50 years later, no one has ever seen a snake around this pool. Yeah. Oh, that, that's so wonderful when you stop to think of all the 
great things that God has done. Yeah. I was privileged to preach the 50th anniversary at uh, Success Arkansas, uh, I'm sorry, Corning, Arkansas, Moark, Arkansas, right next to Corning. And uh, my mother and dad went on 21 day fast and prayer before they started the meeting because there, there was nobody in the county or anywhere that had received the Holy Ghost baptized in Jesus' name. So he was truly a pioneering preacher and carried the gospel into places they'd never heard it before. And uh, he went in there and after fasting 21 days, started the meeting and the pastor asked me to come preach the 50th. And uh, he said that nobody would dare go near until he started and everything began to come together and said the first night Elder Kilgore stood there, place was covered with people, and he had such a glow of the presence of God, you can imagine 21 days, and said people began to break down and weep, and 18 brand new people received the Holy Ghost that night. And the same thing happened the second night, and then he preached and preached week after week, the Methodist pastor received the Holy Ghost. His wife received the Holy Ghost. The entire congregation of the Methodist Church received the Holy Ghost. So he didn't have to stop to build a church. Took the sign off, First Methodist Church, but First Pentecostal Church. <laughs> Amen. Oh my, what wonderful experiences and great things that have happened. And uh, Henry Penn, Oklahoma, he went in there and they fought against it. And they said, we'd never go to that meeting. And, and uh, one night after everybody had gone, there were eight people left. They were taking the lanterns to put them in the schoolhouse next door, uh, next door to the open air meeting. And uh, this uh, seven of the people uh, sitting in the car watched him as he came out. And as he came out, a tall, bright angel was walking behind him. They didn't know what to think. They had never seen or heard of anything like that. And said, when this brother got in the car, the angel walked right in front of the car, walked right into that, uh, that open air area, stood behind the pulpit where Elder Kilgore preached every night and just simply uh, raised his hands out over those empty places and then just skimmed uh, over the top and disappeared. Well, these folks were so stirred. Nothing like that had ever happened before. And uh, they got in their cars and went up and down those roads all night long, waking people up out of the sleep. You've got to come to that open air meeting. We saw an angel stand behind that pulpit and there were so many to confirm it. A lot of people had said, we'll never go, never plan to go. But after that, you couldn't keep them away. They just kept pouring in there and people receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. Tremendous healings took place. And uh, then it came time for the baptismal service. And they had a big gin pool out there. How many of you folks know what a gin pool is? You have missed half of your life. <laughs> I started picking cotton when I was eight years old. I was the best cotton picking cotton picker in the whole cotton picking <laughs> patch. <laughs> oh, Lord. But he uh, had uh, 80 <clears throat> ready to get baptized. And after he preached, uh, about an hour in the hot sun. He said, now all you folks that are going to get baptized lined up. He said, now you that have heard the message, you're convicted by the word of God. I want you to line up. 
One preacher told me many years later that he had his billfold in his pocket and uh, someone suggested he take his billfold out. He said, I want my money baptized. <laughs> and ladies came in with their high heel shoes. They didn't take it off. They were so convicted by the word, they could hardly wait. And 120 was out there in that big pool. And uh, as fast as dad was able, finally he called Brother Charlie Carter who was on the shore said, Brother Carter, you got to come and help me. So they stood back to back and they just kept coming. And Thanks. another kind of miracle took place. The power of God moved and probably a dozen people floated on the water. And the only way dad could baptize them if they'd come down close enough, he'd just take them Jesus' name, they'd float off. <laughs> now, don't try that unless you're full of the oh, Holy Ghost. <laughs> oh, what miraculous <clears throat> thing. It happened in those days. I was able to go to Grandin, Missouri, and Dad had a great, great outpouring of the Spirit. And the miracle that sparked that revival big open air meeting. A man had died and uh, the hearse was taking him to the morgue. His wife was in there with him. They came by that open air meeting and she told the man, pull back behind that meeting and go in there and ask that preacher to come and pray for my husband. And said he can't, dad came out got right up in that hearse, laid his hand on that dead man, and he sat up rejoicing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Probably the greatest miracle of all of that, they stayed, went to the altar, and both of them received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Right. Amen. Hallelujah. God moves in mysterious ways. His wonders to perform. Let's pray. Let's pray and believe God for the miraculous in the end time. Amen. I'm telling you folks, it needs to be a common thing in a Pentecostal meeting. We need to pray for it, believe for it. Ask for it, live it, sleep it, eat it, and see it happen. Woo! Do our part, and God will do his part. Let's worship the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Bless the name of the Lord. God bless you. So I'm trying to write a book about my father's life and ministry. And uh, I, I got started, wrote several chapters, and then my schedule and going overseas. And I, I don't want to be known as a pastor anymore. I don't ever want to be known as an official anymore. I want to be known as a missionary. All right. Oh, it's for the last seven <clears throat> years, in and out, having great crusades and seeing young people go to the C.P. Kilgore Memorial Bible College. Just the thrill of my life. So I am a missionary. I've always been one at heart. God allowed me to uh, support the missionaries. And then he sent me to Houston, the greatest mission field in the United States. Every nation, every culture is stationed in Houston, Texas. And uh, the Lord began to move on that one church. We raised up 10 Spanish-speaking churches, five African-American churches, one gypsy church, 
Never heard of that. They got the Holy Ghost to Life Tabernacle and said, Brother Kilgore, nobody is going to believe a gypsy. So we want to start a church. I said, go to it. It has grown. I preached anniversary. The house was full of gypsies. The little daughter came to present me with a beautiful bronze eagle and said, uh, Pastor Kilgore, I remember as a little girl in your church, uh, I was born in your church, and uh, you never stopped. I'd, when I'd see you, you'd always took time for me, shook my hand, and, and loved me, and, and uh, said uh, nobody loved gypsies. They didn't trust them, but you somehow trusted us, and now we have a great church. And that was six years ago, and uh, it's a wonderful church. And then we've got a we've got a uh, Filipino church in the making. So one night, 21 nations were represented in one of our services. So you can see what a mission field that we have, and God has allowed oh, me yeah. to be a part of it. I'm nobody special. I can't do anything by myself, but I know a specialist. I know the Lord God Almighty. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, Lord. So the Lord has given me the opportunity to baptize hundreds of people and raise up churches everywhere, 124 preachers and missionaries out of our church. In fact, in Brother Navarro's church tonight, Brother Joe Collins, a Presbyterian boy, a man in our church witnessed to him, brought him to church, and God revealed the truth to him. He's a missionary in Spain today and speaking for Brother Navarro tonight. And the other one that's speaking there uh, just uh, men on the streets of Houston drank, did drugs and everything, came in, and God filled him with the Holy Ghost, and he's there preaching also. You, I'm telling you, folks, I am a millionaire. I have $200 in my pocket. I don't have a savings account. I don't have a retirement. But when I look at all of those that have gone out, I've been privileged to pray for them, pray with them, and to see all that they're doing for God. That's the only reward I ever want. I don't need a savings account to witness and to help people. I don't have to have a retirement. Amen. They say, when are you going to retire, Brother Kilgore? I said, I don't retire. I refire. And I just want to keep going. Yeah. Praise God. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. I feel full right now. I feel so thankful. Oh, yeah. God has been good to me. Oh, Lord. It's some wonderful experiences in the Texas district and folks stood behind me and Brother Russo, I am so happy to see you and your good wife here tonight. You mean a lot to this district. God Amen. bless you. He sure has. Amen. God has blessed me beyond measure and I just want to conclude by telling you, if God did it yesterday, he can do it today. Oh, yeah. Amen. Amen. We're satisfied with too little. I refuse to be satisfied. God help I want to take another step. I'm 85 going on 80. And I want to keep going. 
That's good. That's good. And I've been praying lately, Lord, give me strength in my legs, and I want to do more for you. But I said, if you don't, I'm going to crawl on my hands and knees to yes. keep working for you. Oh, yes. And I mean that, folks. I'm not going to give up, give in, give out. I'm going to keep holding on. Amen. I want this church to believe God for the miraculous. Wow. Oh, God. Glory. Oh, my. Let's stand and worship the Lord. Oh, God. Yeah. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. My Lord, my Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Lord, my Lord. Praise God. Praise God. My God. Holy Ghost is in this place. Thank you, God. Thank you for this wonderful truth. Thank you, God, for the privilege to serve you. Hallelujah. My God, I give you praise. I give you praise. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. I bless you. you may be seated. I believe that Every generation runs on a parallel track. We have an obligation to the previous generations before us. I don't ever want to forget Brother James Kilgore, Brother C.P. Kilgore, the work that they have done and the generations that they represent. They have allowed us the privilege to, to hear, to participate in this. I am a debtor to men like this. Often in my prayer, I will list men that God has brought into my life that have helped strengthen me, that have helped me to continue in my walk with Him. And I list Brother Kilgore in that list. Thank you, Brother Kilgore, for what you mean to us in the kingdom of God. Praise. Brother Russo, I didn't even see you earlier. Why don't you please come up here real quickly? I normally let you sit there with Sister Russo. Would you just come and greet these people? I, I think it would be a good time for you to do that. We love Brother Russo. Would you stand? Thank you, Brother Hunt. You may be seated. It is a great honor to be here tonight to uh, be with Brother Kilgore again. He and I worked together in the district for over eight years, and I love and appreciate him very much. Then when I first came to Lufkin and was home missions director, Brother Williams was my pastor in the church that my family attended while we were here. But tonight to share with you and the rich legacy of the United Pentecostal Church, the things we're hearing and are going to hear tonight from Brother Williams are things that are foundational and bedrock for the church of the living God. Amen. This is what we're built on. Right. There, there are trends that happen the world changes, technology, a lot of things are brought up. But when you boil it all down and you cut away all of the clutter and the things that could, could infiltrate the church, the foundation of the church is still standing strong. And it's because of men like Brother Kilgore, Brother Williams, 
that are handing to us tonight, to these young men, right. young ladies sitting in front of me, to people that perhaps just prayed through not long ago to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And, and you came in after the era that they lived through. A lot of us here did. But we must never forget where we came from. And if we ever forget where we came from, we're going to lose our destination. All right. But I'm glad tonight that it's in secure hands. And there are people grasping the truth tonight that are going to march on with this great gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. I give honor to you, Pastor, Brother Hunt. What a great man he is. And uh, what, a, what, a, what a wonderful thing this is tonight to have this opportunity for every one of us. Thank you, Brother Hunt, for organizing this. And a uh, great man. I appreciate you very Thank much. You. God bless you. Thank you for the privilege of addressing the congregation. Thank you, Brother Lisa. Thank you so much. I was a freshman at Texas Bible College. I heard about him. Brother O.W. Williams, Stonewall Pentecostal Church. Quite a preacher, I heard. And then I'm in Pentecostal Doctrine One, the oneness of the Godhead. And in walks Brother O.W. Williams as my instructor. I don't know how many times we ended up on our knees with our faces on those seats of those student desks, praying, worshiping God, the Holy Ghost would come in. In a Bible college class, mind you, in a freshman class, mind you, it had to be real. Amen. <laughs> and then later, he became my district superintendent. He brought great revival to the Texas district. He is a visionary. Yes. He believes God for great things because he knows that his God is great. Yes. Now, tonight, in these past 10 years, I've had the awesome privilege, and it's a humbling thing, to be able to come to this church and sit on the platform with Brother Williams. I love him, Good. respect him, and honor him highly for his work in the kingdom of God. He is a man of integrity and a man of faith. Would you stand please in honor of Brother Williams? We love you so very much, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. I do feel the Holy Ghost. Yes. And I'm glad we do in an apostolic church. Thank God. Well, Brother Kilgore, you just blessed me all over again. I'm telling you, such a great man. He and I were together many, many times. And, of course, when uh, we were both pastors in Houston, we never did have a quarrel. No, no. Nor, nor we didn't have any pity parties. We had a great time together. Right. So it's good to hear him and to be with him. Uh, you may be seated, please. And my dear pastor here, he's my friend. Yeah, I love a lot. That's all right if I cry a little. Don't worry about that. Well, I do a lot of that now. But I've, I've told people that if I, would, I wouldn't have a, a son that would be any more kind or helpful than my pastor. Good. Brother Hunt. Good. So it's a joy tonight to be here 
And it is definitely an honor to come home to my own church and talk about some of the old days of my life. One thing Brother Kilgore has on me, or well, he had a lot of things, but one is important. Brother Kilgore was born and raised in this Pentecostal church. Right. That means an awful lot where you realize it does it or not. I was born in near the rattlesnakes and the copperheads and the bootleggers <laughs> in uh, Tennessee. The whiskey's still all around, somebody said. You never measured corn by the bushel anymore. You measured by the gallons. <laughs> well, that, that that's, is some of the things that I lived in. Our home didn't have a Bible in it. I wanted one, but we didn't have it. As a kid, I thought about it. But... Uh, I, I appreciate my old mother and daddy. They were pioneers from way back. Dad was born in 1872. Mother was born in 1879. And dad's father was, a, 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 I suppose, involved in the army. He was in the army of the 1912 or 1812 war. I am a son, uh, a grandson, rather, from, from uh, the, uh, the, the army man. But it's good to be here with you tonight. I <clears throat> will not go back too far, other than I'll tell you that I've had 69 beautiful years preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And of all the years, I have no complaints. It's been a wonderful, wonderful life. I've been crushed uh, naturally. I've been hurt. I've stood by the dead and all of that. But thank God, I thank him every day for living for him and loving him. I want, I want to tell you, first of all, it is not hard to live for Jesus. Amen. It is a pleasure to live for Jesus. Everything I am, everything I have been, everything I ever will be is Jesus. Yes. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. No, my young days... My robe was a ragged pair of overalls and shoes tied up by baling wire. To make them last from cold weather until April. And then it was barefooted the rest of the way home. But I enjoyed it. I have no complaints about that. Hallelujah. But I'll tell you this. The greatest thing that ever happened to me All right. was the night that I went to hear a Pentecostal preacher in a little schoolhouse. Praise God. And the voice of God reached into my soul. I fell in that little, well, the little rise is all there is in that country schoolhouse. But that my, was my altar. I fell in there and I wept and I cried. Praise God. I was convicted of my dirty, filthy sins. Praise God. I'd been drunk and crazy drunk and all that type thing. The wife told me if I ever came home drunk again, she's going to whip me. She said she did. I don't know. But then Jesus came into my life. 
Hallelujah. Amen. When I didn't know what the Holy Ghost was, I didn't know anything about uh, it, uh, its doctrine. Uh, my mother, all I ever heard about it was my mother said they crawled around on the floor and barked like dogs. That was the recommendation I had for Pentecost. I was going to be a Baptist. <laughs> my dad was a Baptist. My mother was a, a Baptist. No, my dad was a Methodist. My mother was a Baptist. My Christian sisters were Church, church Christ. So I looked at the three and I said, I believe Mom's church is more spiritual than the rest of them. So I was going to join it. But God beat me to it and sent me to the altar. Nearly two years later, not knowing anything about the Holy Ghost, I was in another little school building. And uh, Assembly of God man was preaching that night. And remember what he preached. He said, you ladies need to go get you a sewing machine and then put some link to your dresses. And, and, and that was what he preached. And believe it or not, the power of God fell. And shouting. And, and the worship of the Lord and the Spirit of God move, moved on my heart. And it said, move, put your hand over the brother's leg that's shouting and having a good time. I put my hand over on his leg and four hours yet... Later, uh, I came to senses. God knocked me out of the seat. I mean, literally knocked me out of the seat. And I laid there, and prayed, and shouted, and talked and, in tongues, and messed up my first suit I ever had in my life. <laughs> oh, what, a, what, what an experience. I say, what an experience. Everybody needs the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. You need to talk in tongues every day. Don't mess around here for a month and get as dry as a, a, a cornflake. Hallelujah. Let a little refreshing come once in a while. Well, hallelujah. Praise God. So I began to get the call of God to preach. It wasn't hardly as strong at first when it hit my heart. But I kept on feeling it. And I said, God, if you will speak to me personally and tell me that you've called me to preach, I'll, I'll go preach for you. And I held to that a while. Then I talked to my district superintendent, Brother Gurley. And when I told him that story, Brother Gurley looked at me so kind, with no criticism, and said, Brother Williams, don't you think you're a little unkind to God? Words to that effect. I said, Brother Gurley, I guess I am. That day, I went down under the hill and knelt at an old oak tree. God. And there I said, God, I'm going to preach for you. I'll do anything you want me to do. I, I'll, I'll do anything you ask me to do as far as I'm able to do it. And about the time I, I was ready to preach, the army called me. And I had to go to full, full, oh, full, oh, oh, well, enter, uh, Georgia somewhere. And uh, I went to the Navy, 21. Uh, 21 days, go home. Get your business ready. Take care of your family. We'll call you. You'll be in the Navy. When I went back home and got off of that bus, I went to Dyersburg, Tennessee, and began to preach the gospel. I never thought of the 21 days. 
I thought of the call I've got in my heart. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. So those 21 days meant nothing to me. Two weeks later, we had prayed a bunch of people through to the Holy Ghost. Went from there to the next uh, uh, revival. And two weeks revival, that's all we could have in those days. But you had to have it every night. So we preached every night. And when they had a radio, I had to preach the radio message. But we get, God gave us souls. And on and on we went until we were tired of it. We wanted to find somewhere find a place. And so we found an old Presbyterian church that had been used but was now vacant. We bought it from a doctor there in the city. And we borrowed the money to do it. I broke. I don't have any money. And uh, so we began to preach. The first day we had, I'd, I'd been working around in the town for a while. We had 47 people for the first service. We had a revival. It was going and going big. But in order to move to, uh, the, to the church in Ridgely, Tennessee, I sold my wife's cook stove. I had to. I didn't have any money. We had to move to Ridgely. And we moved to Ridgely. We rented a little apartment that for $7. No running water. No restroom. Cornfield out there behind. And that's what we had when we went there. But when I opened up and we began to preach, to that lot, bunch of lost souls. We baptized people nearly every Sunday. Good. Hallelujah. We had no baptistry. We lured them up and went down to the Mississippi River. And I baptized people every Sunday, nearly a bunch of them, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And before it was... And before it was over with, I baptized over, over 600 people, I believe. Praise God. But remember, the devil began to fight. And my wife had acute appendicitis. And immediately she had to have an operation. We took her to the Dyerberg, to the hospital. I said, Doctor, we want her to be, he, be uh, treated here in the hospital, but I don't have any money. He said, I don't have, uh, I, I will not charge you anything, but the hospital, you've got to pay them. I said, okay, I'll pay them. That was on a Sunday, I believe. Friday, they always kept, person in for five days in those days for that type of operation. And Friday, I went uh, to, well, I'd been to see her every day, but this Friday I said, honey, we're going home this morning. She looked at me so nice and kind. She said, do you have any money? I said, no, I don't have any money, but we're going home this morning. I didn't know what God was going to do. My life has been a life of faith, yeah. believing, trusting God. I had no idea what God was going to do. But I told her, we're going home. We're going to get an ambulance. And we're going to take you home. And the, the, a door, the door we were, we were the, the room we were in, came a knock and I t said come in and in walked Rosa Belbrine a friend of ours and she sat down and looked at me and she said brother Williams do you need some money I said yes I need some money she didn't ask me how much she took her 
billfold or rather her, her checkbook and threw it over in my lap. And I, I had money. I mean, I had money. <laughs> I, I took that checkbook book down and asked him at the window, how much do I owe you? Yeah, they told me, I don't remember how much it was. I wrote them a check. I said, uh, now we want an ambulance. Uh, <laughs> I said, how much is it going to cost? I told them. Thank God. I went back, wife dressed, put her in the ambulance, and took her home in five days. God was working all that time. Two weeks later, probably, I, I met Roosevelt, and I said, Roosevelt, there's one thing I want to ask you about. She said, what do you want to ask me? I said, why did you come to my room and ask me uh, how, if I needed any money? She said, Brother Williams, I was walking along the street here in, in the area, and the Lord spoke to me and said, go down to the hospital. Brother William needs some money. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. You talk, you talk about God blessing. If you, if you will just put your faith in action, you can build a church. You can do whatever you want to do. <laughs> Hallelujah. Don't doubt. Don't hesitate. Thank God. Believe it. Yes. I went to the city of Houston or Brother Kilgore was, and some of the brethren, I don't know where they'd been, but they said, Brother William, you can't get any money here for a church to build a church. I said, okay. Oh, th thank you, Brother. You're busy. You're so kind. And uh, they got <laughs> yeah, more trouble as were. <laughs> God still performs miracles. But we were having problems. <clears throat> the first uh, uh, fire we built in our nice Presbyterian church with our stained windows, the house caught fire, and the church burned. The devil spoke to me. I mean, the devil spoke to me. He said, now you might as well just give up, forget it, and, and go about your business. For, a, I, for a, I, 10 seconds, I thought about it. But then I got mad. I said, devil, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm going to build a church. I... I came here on the authority of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to build this church. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No. So I kept baptizing people. By the dozens, I baptized them in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. But I run out of what little money I did have and couldn't pay the bills. I told my wife, I said, I'm, I'm going to met down to my church this morning. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask God to have somebody to, to meet me and give me some money for this church. I don't want to ask them. They're going to stop me and give me money. I walked down to the, hospital, to the uh, post office, a fellow big man by the name of Damon Hedden became a friend. He looked at me and he said, uh, Preacher, did you got your church paid for? I said, no, sir, I hadn't, Mr. Hedden. He said, you go down to, to my office and tell my uh, secretary down there to write you a check for $250. Wow. $250 in 19 and 45 was like a, 
like a thousand or more now. Yes. I got, I went down there and got that check. Oh, I straightened my shoulders. I, I was really doing business now. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I, I began to pay bills. That wasn't but 15, 20 at that, that time, but there's a bunch of them. And the time I got through, every bill was paid. Everything was just right. Hallelujah. 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 But the devil didn't like that. My car broke down. And my, my wife, of course, had the, the problem of sickness again. And uh, she had to go to the National Hospital. But uh, uh, we just trusted the Lord and walk all the way by faith, you're going to do it. You're going to do it. Yes. And to eight miles, eight miles away down the road, there was a, a uh, another church that went out of business, and we bought it. We went down and organized a group there, and had a pastor. To come. That was I'd been there about four years then. About the fifth year, I had a great burden for to have a church over in Union City, 31 miles away, and about 8,000 there. And I trusted God. I didn't have any money to do it. I mortgaged my car. I, bought, I borrowed the money on my name, and I bought me a lot. And uh, I got ready to build. <clears throat> I didn't have any, any money to build. What are you going to do, preacher? I'm going to build a church. Right. Hallelujah. And uh, I told my wife, I said, I'm going to pray this morning. And I'm going, I was at that time a living at Union City. I said, I'm going over to Tiptonville. Damon Hedden has a big sawmill there. And I'm going to talk to Damon to see if I can get him to bring the, the limp lumbers I need to build this church. So that morning I w drove in over there. He had a big layout there. Walked up to him. Of course, Damon knew me well. I said, uh, Mr. Heyman, I said, I want to build a church over in Union City. I don't have any money at all. I said, uh, would you consider uh, of uh, selling me the lumber? He, he didn't stop. He said, uh, brother, he said, Reverend, he said, I'll take my trucks tomorrow. And he had five trucks, I think. And he said, I'll put every stick of lumber you need on that ground to build that church. Wonderful. And he said, I'll cut it 50%. Praise and God. you can pay me when you're ready. Praise when you got it. Hallelujah. Praise Hallelujah. In a few months, we had a beautiful brick church on 51st Street, uh, uh, one block from the big, ho big hospital there. It will work when you believe God. If you're going to doubt it, you might as well forget it. But trust God and believe him with all your heart. I've been uh, trying to be cut off from even going and preaching for, uh, for people, re revival. I, I was supposed to have gone to Wichita, Kansas for our brother uh, <clears throat> brother. Florin, what is his name? <laughs> Cornwell, Brother Cornwell. I was going to preach there. I went to the uh, Houston, laid my receipt down at the at the, the counter of the airport. They looked at it. They said, Reverend, you've been you've been canceled. You can't go. 
I said, who can't to me? I, I thought I was the only one that could do it. You, but you've been canceled. We don't know how, what happened. But you have been canceled. I said, how far can you send me? They said, we can send you to Dallas. I said, put me on. I'll go to Dallas. I got, got to Dallas, to the Fort Worth airport. And uh, I walked in, threw my uh, material down, the man, and I said, I'm, le I'm leaving to, for Wichita, Kansas today. And I've got a uh, service tonight. They looked at me and they said, well, you, you've been canceled. We, we can't do it. They said, the plane's going to leave in five minutes. And uh, uh, besides, there's not a, a seat left on the plane. I folded my arms, pulled back against the wall and just went back against it. I said, now it's going to be interesting to see what God does to this one. <laughs> That's what I said. And I stood there until God moved. And a man with a red coat came walking by. I said, hey. He said, yes. And I told him my story that I had to preach tonight. And uh, he said, Reverend, stand there just a moment. He went over to the, to the people, that were, the man that were letting you go in. And matter of well, four minutes, three or four minutes, he said, Pastor, come over. I went over there, and he said, there's one vacant seat left in this plane, and that's first class, and we're going to put you on. Wow. Praise God. God, God didn't, me want, didn't want me going over there to our seat. He put me. He put me in first, first class. Hallelujah. I went to Wichita Falls, or Wichita rather, and I had three nights there. The first night, a young doctor came to me and said, Reverend, that I love to sing in the choir, but I can't. He said, my voice is gone. I said, just a moment. I talked to him a little bit. I said, I'm going to pray for you and ask the Lord to remove that trouble. I prayed for him, and he began to worship the Lord. And the next night, I saw him up in the choir singing, and they waved at me. <laughs> Hallelujah. But the beautiful thing of it all was 30 people received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Out of that, hallelujah. Praise God. I was in West Virginia preaching a camp meeting. And while preaching, no, I'm sorry, this is another, another trip. Let me get it first. Uh, and this, uh, well, I'll go ahead and tell you. And preaching this camp meeting. And while I was preaching this camp meeting, they brought in a man that had terminal cancer of the brain. He was one of our pastors. We prayed for him, and instantly, the man took off running around the building, shouting and praising God, and then came and got him a room for the week, and he came to church every night worshiping God, free from that sickness. Praise God. It's, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. Faith is powerful. Amen. We look over face. Faith is too simple for our brain a lot of time. When God says it, he means it. You don't have to, uh, to work on it to find out what the answer is, just believe God and begin to pray and to begin to seek the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. I love him. I worship him. Amen. Before you finish, I want to 
want you to tell that story you told in the office about the woman that didn't have any eyeball. Okay, I'll do that now. Thank you. I'll tell you the story that sometimes I uh, sometimes I don't tell it to some people because it's it's too great for them to accept it. I was having a revival there with Brother K.V. Reeve. And uh, I was having prayer, prayer lines. People line up there, sometimes look like a hundred or more. I've already preached, and I don't have a dry thread in my body, on my body. And then I Pray for them an hour. I've done it until they had to leave me out. But you know, it's so, it is so beautiful to work for Jesus. Amen. Amen. And uh, the fifth person I came to that night in the prayer room, prayer line, was one of our, the daughters of one of our uh, men, uh, friends up in, uh, in um, another state. She came for prayer. I had a, one eye out. Uh, I, black, black, just white, and no sight. We prayed for her. And when we prayed for her, the Spirit of God moved upon that eye and cleared it, fixed it back in her head, and she began to scream and holler and worship God. I'm seeing, I'm seeing. Hallelujah. We let her shout. <clears throat> but the next, next person was a lady. Uh, I didn't notice her person, actually. I just talked to her, and uh, she said, Reverend, she said, uh, I'm a Catholic. And she said, I've been a Catholic all my life. But she said, I have come here for you to pray for me. I have no eyeballs. My eyeballs have been removed long ago. But I want you to pray for me that I can see. There was a Catholic knew nothing about the power and the presence of God standing before a Pentecostal preacher. God, you can't fail. You need, you, people need help. And they're hurting. Try your best to give it to them. Amen. And when I prayed for her, she looked out. She said, I see lights in this building. And don't get ahead of me. God didn't make her any extra eyeballs. She still was laying flat, just like before she came. She said, well, I see lights. Then she looked across the building and said, I, I see what I thought a, a congregation would look like. And then a lady came by and she looked at her, put her hand to uh, the uh, body of, of the lady, and she said, your blouse is lighter than my blouse. The next night, there's a, quite a few people from headquarters over there to see it that. I was glad to see them all. In fact, C.M. Beckton's wife, when she saw her, that demonstration of, of seeing lights and everything, she was there the next night praising God for us. And, and I, Margie was wide open. She said, I've never seen anything like this in all my life. I said, I haven't either. Hallelujah. But the Lord sent that woman there to save her soul. 
fact, in about three weeks, pastor wrote me, we baptized that woman in the name of Jesus. A few weeks, a few weeks later, a few weeks later, he, he called me, said, Brother Williams, she's received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. God reached her through that miracle in order to save her soul. I was in Dallas, Texas, preaching a revival for somebody. And uh, one day the, the word of God hit me and he, it said, go home. And uh, get a, a program on the radio. And I, that's all they told me. And uh, I went home as quick as I could and I got a, a program on the, the radio there. And uh, I, I guess the first Sunday, I'd preach in faith and confidence in God. First Sunday after I started preaching, a lady came, nice looking lady. I knew she wasn't Pentecost. But she had terminal cancer and she was dying. She had heard me preach the power of faith. She had come for me to pray for her and for her to be healed. I prayed for the woman and it was a wonderful miracle. The mighty power of God moved her in such a marvelous way she began to repent and turn to God with all of her heart. And uh, then I said, I asked her, I said, do you want to be baptized in Jesus' name? She said, yes. So we sent her up to the baptistry and ladies come rushing out, said, Brother Williams, she's got a, some, a colostomy or something down her stomach. Doctors have told her not to ever get it wet at all. And do you want to baptize her? You go ask her, does she want to be baptized? Knowing that, they came back and said, she said, I want to be baptized. I took her and baptized her in, in the name of Jesus Christ, and she went down below the water. They all do when I get a hold of them. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't mess with them. Hallelujah. And when that woman came up and started redressing, there wasn't a wet part of that body, of that part of that body. She went all over, all but that one spot. God laid his hand on that and would let the water come. Hallelujah. 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 Why don't you turn your faith loose and begin to trust God and to see him operate in your life? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be the Lord. Oh God. They, one night I was preaching for the brother, I forgot his name now, in Cleveland, Texas. And a, a hearse drove up. And a lady was in it. She couldn't walk. She's white as a sheet. And couldn't eat nothing but baby food. They rolled her in on the stretcher. They wanted her to hear me preach, I guess. So I preached the, the message of faith and confidence in God. And when, when I came to that lady, I said, lady, are you dressed properly that you can get up out of that stretcher, off that stretcher? She said, yes, I have my gown on. But I... I couldn't walk hardly without help. I prayed for that lady, and instantly she came off of that stretcher, both hands raised, praising God, hallelujah, and healed of the power of God. She walked out and went into the car and 
went home. But anyway, before she did, she was in the aisle talking in tongues and praising God. And the two undertakers that brought her, nice looking young men, black suits, they fixed her suit just right before, uh, before uh, I, uh, uh, oh no, before uh, they, she, they knew what she was, so I'm sorry. They did not know what had happened. So they walked from the entrance there down about halfway. That little old lady was over in, in a side with hands up praising God. She saw him. She said, praise the Lord. <laughs> they went on and picked up the stretcher and, and went out. But she went to the car and went home and began to eat and uh, be well and strong. Most of the time, it's not God's will that you are sick. Amen. God did not in, invent sickness. He invented a remedy for it in the New Testament. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah. I hope that sinks into you. Praise God. When I was in, in the ministry of faith and confidence, I, I'm still in it with my soul and spirit. It's just as strong as it ever was. But like I told the brethren tonight, you know, Brother Hunt's office, the old chariot is broken down that carries that call. And so I, I'm not able to do it anymore. But when I see a sick person, I still long for the privilege. Oh, if I could just get... Near, uh, near them and talk with them about what Jesus will do for them. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, it's, it's so genuine. It's so real. I was, I was in Maryland. Tell this and then I'm going to turn the service back to Brother Hunt. I was uh, in the quest business. Right? We had that for quite a while. And I was preaching on a Wednesday night on divine healing. We had a great time healing. People healed all over the place. And Thursday morning, Brother, oh, what's his name? That boy, he's dead now. The big, fat, short fellow from. Billy Cole. No, not that. No. But then, you don't know. He's about four, four feet square. <laughs> but it, it was, he was over, it was over 400 pounds. I wish I could remember his name. Could you tell me, babe? What? You got to yell at me. Billy Cole. Billy Cole. <laughs> hey. I knew it all the time, but it wouldn't come out of the back of my brain. <laughs> Billy Cole was supposed to preach Thursday night on the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and he was one of the great men of, of the Holy Ghost baptism preaching in that part of the country. And his people were there, hundreds of them, but they were waiting for Billy Cole to preach on uh, the Holy Ghost Thursday night. He was teaching that morning, and uh, came lunchtime, and we went to lunch. And while I was at lunch, Billy had come in earlier. He come back and stopped at my table. He looked at me. He said, Brother Williams, did the Holy Ghost tell you this morning that you're supposed to preach tonight? I said, oh, Billy. Don't worry about it. You're going to preach. He said, don't lie to me. I'm a prophet. I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. He told me, and he told me what to preach. And uh, so I preached it, and we had 30 people to get the Holy Ghost that night. Amen. 
34 people raised their hands they wanted the Holy Ghost. And 30 of them, according to the pastor, received Jesus' name. It will work. My Lord, I'm anxious to see God raise up somebody that has a real burden for the lost. Praise God. And the sick and the dying. Yes. <laughs> Praise God. I did as long as I was able. <laughs> as long as I could hold up. And in my heart, I'm doing it every day now. But in my spirit and in my body, Thank you, Jesus. it won't work. Praise God. God love you. I love every one of you so much. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Amen. All right. Praise God. Thank you, Elder. Brother Williams, thank you for letting us feel your heart beat again. My brother Kilgore reached over and touched me and said, I don't have to get back up because the plan was for him to come and talk to us about the future, what he, his burden, his passion for, for us and our future. But brother Kilgore, I don't think if anybody found out that I went ahead and dismissed, I think they'd be upset. He's worried about us being here too long. Now, folks, honestly, if you're, if you're uncomfortable, we just you can stand. You can do a jumping jack or two. But I, we won't have an opportunity like this all the time. And I just feel the Holy Ghost has a little bit more that he'd like to talk to us about. Yeah. So, Brother Kilgore, could I ask you to come back and preach to us right Tomorrow now? Or the next Tonight. <laughs> Would you? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Elder. You've blessed me all over again. I won't take but just a few moments. But I feel like, you know, we've heard way in the distant past. Thank you, Jesus. And then Brother Williams has brought us up to date through our generation and reaching into this generation. But I feel like I'm talking to a generation out here. The Lord wants you to dig deeper, to climb higher, and to reach further than you've ever gone before. And I just want to challenge you in closing here tonight. You will never be satisfied until you reach that place where you feel God is going to use you. And maybe a supernatural experience. But I'd want to challenge this church. You have had great victories, great revival, great miracles. God wants to take this church a little further. And this night could be the beginning of a great revival. And you could be a blessing to this fellowship all over this part of Texas. I really believe that. Are you willing to climb higher? I was preaching in Germany and in Switzerland and they wanted me to go to the highest mountain. We took the tram halfway up. They had a big restaurant called the Halfway House. And then they told me the story, of course, to climb to the top. There's only one out of maybe 10,000 that will keep going higher. 
But everybody says, this is as far as I want to go. And if we're not careful, that mentality will grip our hearts where we'll say, halfway is far enough for me. I'm satisfied with where I am. I want to tell you, this 85-year-old man and my dear brother here, we're not satisfied yeah. even in our age. I want to keep climbing. I want to go higher. I'm challenging this church. Let's be willing to go a little bit higher. Amen. Let's get behind our good pastor like never before. I, I, I don't know when I've heard a pastor that expressed a burden in his, what he's doing and in his actions and this great meeting here tonight. So let's get behind him and I want to dig deeper. I want the Lord to dig in my heart. I have lain on the floor at the church for several weeks now just enjoying being in the presence of God. And he's challenged my heart. That's why I feel like I can talk to you a little bit. Let's purpose in our hearts. We're not going to be satisfied. We're going to climb higher. We're not going to stop halfway. We're not going to have halfway meetings. We're not going to have halfway anything. We're going to get everything that God wants us to get. We're going to make ourselves available. And I challenge us, all of us, to reach farther than we ever have before. About the time I think I've reached far enough then the Holy Ghost talks to me and I get broke up before God and I want to go further and I, I still have that vision, burden and desire. I've never lost it after all these years. So let's go further. I've enjoyed my pulpit in Starbucks at home. I went in there two years ago and just started talking and visiting and I would point once in a while across the Walmart parking lot to see the top of the church. And, uh, but I never did say, now you've just got to go to church with me. I never did feel like doing that. But I just showed as much love as I could. And one day I, Char I said, Charlotte, do you have something you want me to pray with you about? She started weeping and said, pray for my father. He's in the penitentiary. And uh, I've never really had a father. You've been more like a father to me than anybody. And when I go in, they all holler, Papa K, glad to see you. They know I'm not going to preach to them. They know that I'm going to share with them whatever I can share. I took Charlotte by the hands and I prayed for her. And a few days later before Father's Day, she said, uh, Papa Kay, I'm going to go and help celebrate Father's Day with you because I've never had a father, never been inside of a church house in all of my life. And uh, she came that first Sunday a year ago, last Father's Day, and came to the altar. God filled her with the Holy Ghost. And from that Father's Day, from that Father's Day till this Father's Day, she, young people, she's brought 13 others, and they've received the Holy Ghost and been baptized in Jesus' name. East you, you haven't seen anything yet. Your best days are ahead. God's getting ready to do something special for you. Don't be satisfied. I'd like to see somebody get out of your seat and come up here and say, it's going to begin in my heart this very night. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 
I appreciate what I feel here tonight. My own heart is challenged, and I uh, had an opportunity to go to the first Arabic conference, Pentecostal, in uh, Bethlehem. Out of Bethlehem a ways, they had a large building, and an Arab pastor had asked me to come and preach the very first one. And it was a challenge, and I had my little old sermon together. And I said, Lord, my, my little old sermon doesn't fit this congregation. Arab men in there, ladies with the thing over their head, and, and I, I just couldn't feel, it. he said to me, I promise you, he said, I said, if you would lift me up, I would draw and I began to preach about Jesus. I said, you folks out here have heard Jehovah all your life, but I want to show you that Jesus, Jehovah of the Old Testament is Jesus of the New Testament. And I had memorized what Jesus was in every book of the Bible, and I started going and comparing it with, with the New Testament, what he was in the Old Testament. He did it, fulfilled it as Jesus in the New Testament. And I felt especially annoyed because I was lifting up Jesus every word, every word. Amen. And then all of a sudden, those big old Arab men started getting out of their seats before I finished and made a line across the front, weeping. That Arab man that invited me said, Brother Kilgore, I've never seen an Arabic man shed tears in all of my life. It wasn't me. It was the one I lifted up. You don't know what you can do until you start lifting up Jesus. Talking about Jesus. Glory. I'm challenging somebody here tonight. Climb higher. Dig deeper. Reach out a little further. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I feel the Holy Ghost moving. I, I'm just waiting on somebody to say, hey, I'm going to get in this thing. I'm going to get involved. I'm going to pray like I've never prayed. I'm going to dig like I've never been able to before. So thank you, ma'am. Thank you. There should have been young people ahead of you. Praise God. Amen. It's going to happen. You're going to start a revival, you that are coming right here tonight. You're going to start a revival in this church. I'd like to have, ask as many out there as will to come and stand behind these. I want you to lay your hand on the shoulder of somebody next to you. And I want you to begin to pray for that one and let God use you to help bring a revival like you've never seen before. Yeah. Glory! Praise God! Praise God! Blessed be the Lord! Blessed be the Lord! That's it. Lift your voice. Lift your voice. Go ahead. Praise God! Praise God. 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 Bless the name of Jesus. Bless the name of Jesus. Bless the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Glory, glory, glory. Oh God. Oh God. Oh God. 
Hallelujah. 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 Bless the name of Jesus. 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 Thank God. Bless the name. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Jesus. 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 